Hinch Girl, Dakota Keikoa Book One, written by Rita Stradling, narrated by Sorrel Brigman. When we were almost to the main entrance, I took in a deep breath and did something really stupid. I stomped on the were tiger's foot with my stiletto boot and sprinted to the back of the club. By sprint, I meant dodged between vampires, ducked under the arms of some uproarious witches, and then ran full out the last distance toward the closed door that led to the back offices. When I reached the closed door, I deliberately turned away, as if lost. Before I moved two feet from the door, big meaty fingers grabbed around the back of my neck and squeezed. Rustam Barnes' other hand shot past me and threw open the closed door. He shoved me down the hall toward the offices. I glanced back, rubbing the back of my neck, and immediately realized how much I screwed up. The were-tiger's teeth elongated, his bones moved under his skin, and he became more feline than human. I broke the first and most essential rule of dealing with wares. Never run from them. If you run, you're prey. As his fingers elongated, I realized I wasn't going to make it to the club owner. My Uncle Bobby could probably take the were-tiger. My Uncle Glacier definitely could. Me? Nope. I had about three seconds before he pounced. I used them to reach down to my boot for my contingency plan. Rustum, stop. The voice was soft but commanding, almost as commanding as the fiddle players had been. Rustum, who had been literally squatting to pounce, stood and straightened slowly. His claws and teeth retracted, but his cat eyes stared, memorizing me. So filled with hatred, I knew that I had just screwed up bad. Bad. Bad as I could have possibly done. Is she underage? The vampire asked. I knew he stood directly behind me though I had not worked up the guts to turn away from Rustum, cold fingers wrapped around my arm. I turned, but did not look up at the vampire's face, and when he began to tug on my arm, I followed meekly. Guard the door, the vampire said to Rustum, as he pulled me out of the hall into his office, which I did not realize we were three feet from. The door clicked behind me. Out of the fire pit, into the volcano. I paused to compose myself while glancing around at the spacious, sleek room. Everything in it had a glassy, sterile look. The vampire kept his gaze on me as he circled to the other side of a possession-free black shiny desk. I have to apologize for my manager's rough treatment of you. He takes underage drinking very seriously. I did not have a sip of alcohol, I said, standing up straight to look up and meet the vampire's gaze. He looked so young, it was creepy, knowing that a century-old psychopath looked out from that cherubic, boy-next-door teenage face. He took me in, too, hungrily. I did not need my powers or to touch him to know how he felt. I did dress for him tonight. I crossed to the desk. Please don't call the police, I whispered, pleading. I don't break the law lightly. He narrowed his eyes on me. What will you do for me? He asked. After a hundred years of doing this, he could not have come up with a better line. I reached out to touch his hand, making him smile. Creep. His hand wasn't exactly cold. Just cool and inhuman feeling. This, I whispered. Reaching up, I unclasped my dampener. I could tell the moment he registered who I was, but it was too late. I had a good grip on his hand and forced my power to dive into his soul. Souls have layers, like onions, but the first few layers of his soul, of any soul, aren't actually the true soul. Like a needle, I immediately drove my power deep through all the layers and uncoiled only enough true soul to keep his body paralyzed, but no more. 
Immediately, I retreated back three layers and sorted through his surface emotions. The first layer of disposable surface emotions that were constantly used in Shed 